Hi guys, welcome back to Break It Down Bible Study, Lesson 9. Please watch Lessons 1 through 8 if you have not already. Please share them with a friend, with family members, with your church, because these lessons are so important to help people who are unfamiliar with how to handle the Bible. It helps them to understand what God is trying to say to his people. This video here, we're going to discuss application. We have discussed how the Bible is composed. We talked about how it's divided in the Old and New Testament into nine categories. We have talked about word studies, common word study fallacies. We've talked about how to interpret the Bible. Should it be literal or symbolic? We talked about the four gospel writers and how we can know that they are trustworthy. We talked about Paul's letters to the churches. So we've covered a lot of ground in a short period of time. I will tell you now that I have not covered all that there is to cover with basic information on how to understand the Bible, but I'm trying to cram in as much as possible to whet your appetite and to get you excited about studying God's Word. For this ninth video, we will be talking about application. We talked about the composition, we talked about the study, we talked about the interpretation. Now we're going to talk about the application, meaning how do we apply what we read to our lives. In order to apply the Bible correctly to our lives, we have to understand some basic things. I will use the letter P to describe five ways to apply the Bible truth to your life. The first P stands for practice. Practice means the actual application or use of an idea, belief, or method as opposed to theories relating to it. So what that means is that instead of us just talking about what would be good to do, it's something that we're actually expected or asked to do in the Bible. Some examples of practice verses are Matthew 6, where Jesus says in Matthew 6, Beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them. Thus, when you give to the needy, sound no trumpet before you. And also in verse 5 he says, But when you pray, here's the practice, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your father who is in secret. So he's telling them, this is what I want you all to do. When you all pray, when you all give to charity, I want you to do it this way. So that is a practice. Or that is something that you should try to do. Some other practice Bible verses are 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 1. Likewise, wives be subject to your own husband. In verse 7, likewise, husbands live with your wives in an understanding way. These are things that he expects all the readers of his letter to do. Another P in no particular order is precedent. Precedent means an earlier event or action that is regarded as an example or a guide to be considered in subsequent similar circumstances. So this means that they do this even in law. If you want to do a particular thing in your particular case, a lawyer might refer to an earlier example that might have happened even 50 years ago and say, well, in this case, this was permitted. In this case, this person got off. So why can't my client get off? So sometimes what we can do in the Bible is we can find a Bible verse and use it as a precedent. So an example of a precedent, or you might want to say precedent, is 2 Kings chapter 20. I'm going to read just certain highlighted verses. Hezekiah became sick and was at the point of death. Verse 2, then Hezekiah turned his face to the wall and prayed to the Lord. In verse 5, thus says the Lord, I have heard your prayer, I have seen your tears, behold, I will heal you. Verse 6, and I will add 15 years to your life. Verse 7, bring a cake of figs and let them take and lay it on the boil that he may recover. So we see here that Hezekiah is asking the Lord to heal him, he had a death sentence. He said, Lord, I've been good. I've been living right before you. Please don't let me die. And so he gave him 15 more years, okay? So some of you all may say, well, I'm going to use that as a precedent. So if a doctor gives you a bad report, God forbid, you might say, I'm going to turn my face to the wall and I'm going to remind the Lord of what I've done for him and how I have served him faithfully. And I hope that he gives me at least 15 more years. You know what I'm saying? So that's like a precedent. You're using a previous Bible verse as a precedent. This passage is not saying that all Christians or Jews should tell the Lord, please give me 15 more years. But it is a precedent that you can use in your own personal life. But I would not teach this as saying that every believer who gets a six month death sentence from cancer, for example, that they should all turn their face to the wall. I mean, I would do it if I were you, but I'm just saying it's not like a practice that's prescribed. It's just a precedent. It's a previous incident that happened that we might want to use as an example for how we might want to address certain issues that arise in our lives. Our next P is for principle. Principle is a fundamental truth or proposition that serves as a foundation for a system of belief or behavior or for a chain of reasoning. It is a rule or belief governing one's personal behavior. It is morally correct behavior and attitudes. You can find a lot of principles in the book of Proverbs. It is a book for people that want to be wise, so some Proverbs I'm going to bring to you that are talking about principles. One is Proverbs 22:29, which says, Do you see a man skillful in his work? 
He will stand before kings. He will not stand before obscure men. This is not telling you that you have to be skillful in your work. It's just saying that if you are skillful or if someone is skillful in their work, they will be around men who have good, high reputation, men who are famous and whatnot. It's teaching you a principle about life, about how the world works and how people work with each other. Another proverb, he who finds a wife finds a good thing and obtains favor from the Lord. Again, this is not something that you are commanded to do. It's not saying that you have to find a good wife. It's just saying that if you find one, if you know someone who's found a good wife, then they have obtained favor from the Lord. They have found a good thing. So every Bible verse should not be read as a commandment. Like, you don't do this, you're cursed. You don't do this, you're going to hell. So that's one way to look at the Bible, the Bible verses. And you apply them to your life. Ask yourself, is this a practice that I have to do? Or is this just a principle? Or is this something I can read and use the precedent for how I live? Because the Bible says that all scripture is profitable. So in 2 Timothy 3, verses 16 through 17, it says that all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. So all scripture is important. Everything in the Bible is important, but they're not all like commandments is what I'm trying to say. So everything in the Bible that you read, it can be used for your good, but... That does not mean that it's like a heaven or hell type of situation, okay? Some people will open up the Bible and just pick a random verse and say, The Lord said you gotta do this. And it's like, if you read it in context, you'll know that some things are not commandments like that. The next P is for a precept. Precept is very similar to principle, but for the sake of this video, I'm gonna use it as like principle mixed with practice. So precept means a general rule intended to regulate behavior or thought. It can be also a writ or warrant. So if you read through the letters in the New Testament, you'll see a lot of precepts there. Now the precepts, they're not like, if you don't do this, you're going to hell, but they're good to do. And I strongly urge you to follow the rules in the Bible. Okay, so 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 11 through 17, I'm going to read the highlighted verses. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable, so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. Verse 13, be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it be to the emperor as supreme or to governors as sent by him to punish those who do evil and to praise those who do good. For this is the will of God, that by doing good, you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. Honor everyone. Love the brotherhood. Fear God. Honor the emperor. So when I see this, I don't think it's something that's saying like, if you don't do this, you're going to hell. Um, if you don't do this, you're not a believer. I see just more like I'm giving y'all instructions on how to govern yourselves in this present world. And so, you know, I don't think if you didn't honor the emperor that you would be considered like you lost your salvation or you're a heathen. You know, it's just that he's giving y'all instruction and he's running to the church. And the church is a group of people that are expected to want to follow a set guideline and rules from their leaders. Let me give you another example of precepts. Um, Ephesians 4, 26-32 has a lot of precepts. Be ye angry and sin not, let not the sun go down upon your wrath. Neither give place to the devil. Let him who stole steal no more, but rather let him labor. Um, that he may have to give to him that needed. It didn't say labor so that you can go to heaven. It just says labor that you may have to give to him that needed. Um, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying. Not so that you won't go to hell, but that it may minister grace unto the hearers. So everything is not like do this or you're going to lose your salvation. Some things are just... Do this so that we can live well as Christians, so that we can honor God, so that we can convert the hearts of unbelievers, you know? And I think that's one thing people, a lot of people are afraid when it comes to Bible application. They're like, I don't even want to read the Bible because if I don't do this right, like, I know there's just many sins up in here. I didn't even know. Nobody told me anything. <laughs> one thing you can do is, like, you can actually search under Bible Gateway. For example, I put let, and I search for the word let in just a letter to the church in Galatia. And I see... In this Bible version, six times the Paul uses the word let. Philippians, I search the word let. So these are not like, do this or you're going to go to hell for all eternity. It's just their commands, they're expecting of you. Again, if you're in a group like a sorority or a job or a church, you're expected to follow certain principles, certain guidelines, certain practices. So he's writing to people who have already agreed to do stuff as a family, as a unit, as a group. So he's telling them, hey, you all remember, did, did we not agree? Did we not agree to do these certain things the same way? So he's saying, let us not do this. Let us do this. So if you join a church, your pastor tells you to do something. He may say, let us meet here Wednesday at 7 o'clock. He's expecting you, since you joined the church, to do this. And the last P that I will mention here is prerequisite. Now, I couldn't find a 
better word for commandment, like you gotta do this, but prerequisite is the best P word I can find. And prerequisite means a thing that is required as a prior condition for something else to happen or exist. So I'm gonna use this one for, if I don't do this particular Bible verse, can I go to heaven? And I'm gonna give you all some examples of that. So some prerequisites to get into heaven, one is forgiveness. Mark 11:25. and whenever you stand praying, forgive. If you have anything against anyone, so that your Father also who is in heaven may forgive you your trespasses. Saying that forgiveness is a prerequisite to being saved. You have to forgive because if you don't forgive, he will not forgive you. Another prerequisite, Mark 3.29. But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness, but is guilty of an eternal sin. So you can't blaspheme the Holy Spirit and be saved. You just can't do it. It's a prerequisite. So certain verses are like to be heeded very seriously. So here's another prerequisite verse, which is, 1 John chapter 4, well, verses 19 through 21. We love because he first loved us. If anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother, whom he has seen, cannot love God whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him. Whoever loves God must also love his brother. So this is saying that you have to love. You must love to be saved because... Christians love because we were first loved. We forgive because we were forgiven. So it's like you cannot be recipient of something so spiritual and divine and yet you deny to other people. So it's a sign of like you might not have been biblically saved because anybody who's biblically saved, they love and they forgive. So don't take this to say that I have to do works to be saved. Your faith in Christ is what saves you. But a faith in Christ that saves you, it also causes you to love and to forgive people. You know, we know John 3 16, but Let's look at John 3, 18. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. So another prerequisite verse that you should read and understand and teach other people is that you have to believe in the name of the only Son of God. You must believe in Jesus Christ to be biblically saved, okay? So certain verses are very serious. You know, they're not something you see forward. Like, well, I don't have to do this. These ones you have to do. You do have to love. You do have to forgive. You do have to believe in Jesus Christ. I don't write the Bible. I just interpret it. You know, I just I just quote it. Certain verses are not up for debate. Certain verses are not um, up for negotiation. They are point blank, period. You must believe in Jesus. You must forgive. You must love. Okay? So now we're going to talk about some application examples. So I'm going to show you all some things in the Bible where Paul will say that something is his opinion versus God's commandment. So, in 1 Timothy 2, I'm going to read certain words in verses 8-15. I desire you then that in every place the men should pray, lifting holy hands without anger or quarreling. Likewise, how women should adorn themselves. And he says, verse 12, I do not permit a woman to teach or to exercise authority over a man. So he's saying, I don't want to allow it. I want you to do this. I, I, this is his opinion. I'm not talking down his opinion. I honor, I honor Paul. And if you go here to 1 Corinthians, we'll see some more opinions of Paul. So this is 1 Corinthians 7. I'm going to read certain verses. From verses 6 to 16. Now as a concession, not a command, I say this. He's saying this is not a commandment. This is something that, something that I, like a precept that I prescribe that you all should do. It's not the Lord's word. This is just my personal opinion. This is my personal holy opinion. I say this. I wish that all were as I myself am, meaning single. He means like don't get married to be single. This is, this, this is not a commandment from God. It's not a commandment from God to be single. He's saying, I think that you should be single. He says, to the married and the widows, I say that it is good for them to remain single as I am. But if they cannot exercise self-control, they should marry. Then verse 10, to the married, I give this charge. Not I, but the Lord. So he's saying, I did say I. I'm talking about really the Lord said this, not me. Okay. Then verse 12, to the rest, I say, I, not the Lord. He let you know, he lets you know when it's the Lord's commandment or the Lord's expectation versus his personal opinion. So again, you all, make sure, ask yourself when you read it. When you try to practice your life, is this practice? Is this principle? Is this precedent? Is this precept? Is this prerequisite? Second Timothy chapter three, verses sixteen through seventeen. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, 
thoroughly furnished unto all good works. So they're all important to teach you something, to make you a better person, to complete God's will for your life, and to fulfill his purposes in the earth. So honor all Bible verses, but apply them correctly. Before we go, I want to talk about some more material that I received from the Kojic Bookstore. This pamphlet is called Following Jesus. I'm a Christian, now what? It talks about the basis of faith in Christian living, salvation, sin and forgiveness, prayer, Bible study in church, fears, doubts, and trust, spiritual gifts, giving and sharing, and reliability of the Christian faith. So, just $3. And I like this because it answers certain questions like, how can I be sure that I'm saved? Can God forgive me? What if I sin? How do I pray? How do I read the Bible? So it gives you a lot of tips on how to do things. Very helpful. It means front and back always. I like this. It um, talks about key verses to memorize to kind of guide you in your faith walk. So I like this. This is really neat. This is good for believers. If you have, um, you know, altar call to church, if people come down and get saved, get their life to Christ, this would be nice to give them. It's only $3. The next pamphlet I want to show you all is the Answers to Evolution. It is a response to public school textbooks. If your children are in public school, they're being taught evolution. They're not being taught the biblical creation story. And so I like this because it talks about 16 questions that they will be challenged with, whether in public high school or public colleges. When I went to college, I was taught some of these theories that are anti-Bible. And so this would have been very helpful to a lot of my peers who did not have a basis in God, a foundation in God. So if your children are going up to college or are in college now, we'll get them this, $3. We'll help them to have a defense against what they may be being taught in school. Last but not least is Soul Care, Seven Transformational Principles for a Healthy Soul by Dr. Rob Reamer. I mean, who in here does not know a Christian that they may be living right, they may be believing in Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, but they don't have victory. They have defeat in their soul. They're going through depression, anxiety, issues with their family, low self-esteem. It's so important that we take care of our soul. We all God wants us to have shalom, wholeness, fullness in our body and our soul. And I like this book because it talks about seven transformational principles. Um, I'll read you three of them. You know, principle one, identity. Principle two, repentance. This book will be very helpful to you. Please get this book from Koji Bookstore. Thank you guys for watching. Please share and subscribe. Bye.